All right. Um, so I'm just going to get started. I'll do a little intro and we'll roll from there. Okay. okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing about 40, I think I'm up to 43 or 44. I'm going to have to go back and number them all because I realized, I, I didn't realize I was going to be doing so many. So um, you can always find all of the webinars on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine. And uh, by the weekend, I'll have them numbered so you can see them in that order if you want to watch them that way. Tonight, my guest is Monique Craig of Epona Mind. Um, we have not met in person, but we um, have kind of briefly interacted because you got some of the Surefoot pads, the physio pads, and I know that you've been using them and posting about that on Facebook. Um, but Monique, since I, I really don't know your background, I'm going to uh, ask you to introduce yourself to everybody and just kind of you know, like, how did you wind up doing what you're doing now? Right. Oh, well, it's a long story. It could be the whole web webinar <laughs> in a bad movie, you know? Um, well, <laughs> I, I have a degree in engineering. Um, I have a minor in math and physics. I used to study, uh, at that time it was called computational linguistic because oh, you froze. a long time ago where we didn't have computers that could do real AI. Uh, I also went to art school, so I've, I've that under my belt. Um, I was going to take a PhD and I, was going, I, I got money to take a PhD at Stanford in computational linguistic. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I had the horse at feet problem. And it just really bothered me a lot. And I just kind of let go of my PhD and went into thinking stupidly, I would solve it in a few months, few years, and then I go back, right? Which didn't happen ever. And then 28 years later, here I am still showing, all right? So I didn't start showing professionally up to 25 years ago, but I do also other things. So I, I, the, the whole thing with my stallion who had feet problem prompted uh, uh, Metron because I, I could not communicate neither to the vets or the farriers, you know, in, 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 in a categoric way. So I wanted to have something we could measure correctly. So that started Metron uh, on measuring system. And of course, my husband helped me with that because I spent too much time showing, um, you know. So my, my engineering scheme, I'm going back to it now, I'll explain. And, um, you know, and then, you know, while I was showing, I didn't like what I see, you know, I, because I studied material science while I was going to put metal on the horse and I can not put metal shoes. I used to put metal shoes and I'm trying to do that and know how to barefoot trim. So I wanted to find um, a happy medium, you know, and a happy compromise between all this and I invented my shoes, right? And then, you know, I, about 10, 10 years ago, I thought I would finish and I'm stopping and it's not happening because I thought <laughs> I'm, I'm going to finish a PhD, which is the joke in the in the house, which you know I publish a bunch of paper and I'm offered to take a PhD. So I, I we'll see how it goes in ten years, okay? Because I'm pretty sure this is going to be staying there, and I don't have time. So I also have a podiatry center, so we have people coming with their horses here. Um, I also rescue. Th this is why I'm stopping showing. Um, because every time the horses cannot stay with their owners, I end up having the horses. Oh, so nice. I, I, I have 12 of mine, and as friend told me, they don't die. I mean, most of, I have six of the 12 that are between, you know, uh, 26 and 30-ish, and you know. So I just lost my, my first one. Uh, I, it was 32 and a half. So oh, that, wow. that was my, my second horse after Shmirnov. So, you know, yeah. So there you go. So it, and and I do locomotion and other thing, and also I teach an introduction to biomechanics to pre veterinarian at Cal Poly. I'm I'm a, I'm a visiting scholar. I'm not a teacher like I go there, but you know like a faculty. But that's what I do, and I lecture around the world, and I've written a book about the hoof and blah blah blah. So you know, um, I I my friend have already told me I did career suicide doing that. But on the other hand, I find following your passion, maybe your slight insanity, um, it, it, it made you a better person, you know, and I'm really, I love horses, you know, so you don't do that for glamour, because I think all of us who are into the equine industry, and especially trying to help horses, it's difficult, it's not, you know, it's not an easy, easy place to be, you know, so because of the nature of the business, you know. So but I'm still impressed with your degree in engineering and computer science, because this, I, I, I First of all, there's not a lot of women that actually ex get that far um, right. and are 
going to a PhD. But second of all, what that really tells me is that you have really looked at it from a very structural perspective of forces and, um, and physics, right. which I think we, we, in horses, I teach riding, I've taught riding for 30 years, and it's the only sport I know where the trainer can tell you to do something that is completely defies the yeah. laws of physics. Yeah, um, exactly. And it's crazy, right? Yes. <laughs> and so I'm yes. always trying to bring in, because I, I have a master's degree in equine reproductive physiology, I'm always trying to bring in the scientific method and you know evaluating, but looking at it from gravity because you cannot avoid gravity. Period. Right. You know? Right. I, and I totally agree. And I think you know, you will see when I give give the talk, it it brings those concepts, and you need to have those concepts of physics. You know, physics exists, and you don't have to learn all the math and all the complicated stuff. But those are concepts that are very very important. And I think to be um, you know, a little bit uh, multidimensional is really important in problem solving, you know? Yeah. But, it, you know, showing is also an art and, and you know, I ride also horses. I mean, I've been riding since the age of six, so I've been riding all my life, but I don't show, I don't have time. But, um, you know, it, it, it's very important that you integrate different, uh, I, I call them scientific culture, so we can problem solve better. Because I think people get stuck in, in, in their belief system and it's nothing wrong, but it creates intellectual subculture. Yes. And I think as far as solving problem, it's not always good. So we need to try to work together and, and try to integrate uh, the knowledge that come from outside. You know, that's very important because I, I, I think we're missing, we have holes, you know, and how we look at things, you know, and no one can know everything or, or have good concepts sometimes. You need to have a little more from the outside, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. That's where I, um, at one point I took a, a workshop called Explain Pain with a man named David Butler from Australia who's studying pain at Sydney University. And, you know, I mean, it was doctors and nurses and PTs and of course the right. little riding instructor, but the concepts he presented so apply to riding, not only for pain, but for fear. And so the right. more, in my opinion, the more we can integrate the sciences right. into the practical and applied, the better it's going to be for everyone. Well, and I, I think it's true, you know, we're just, before everyone could hear us, we're talking about the environment, but I think it's true with everything. We, we, we do need to become more uh, complete, you know, and have different concepts and how we approach problems, you know, because I, I think a lot of things, it's, 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 uh, mentally we get we get stuck in a little in a little box you know so it, it expands our consciousness i mean I'm, I'm not trying to be you know a guru here but i think it does help you know kind of looking at thing at the bigger pictures you know absolutely and you know and the other thing from science that uh, you know it's uh to verify things to not just simply take someone's right. word for it because they're an authority but to evaluate the information and see how it fits with our known world and then how it fits with my belief system um, to come up with the best thing for my horse, as opposed to just taking, and this is what I see again with the horses, that you have a trainer who tells you this is what you are to do. And even right. when your gut's telling you this is totally wrong, you don't question the authority because they're supposed to know better. Um, right. And who suffers? Our horses. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, but I think, I think this is why, you know, things are going to change because I think people are becoming more multidimensional because with all the information we're sharing from different fields. So people who can integrate different information from different fields are, are going to be these specialists because you're, you're no longer the center. You're part of a group that pass information. And I think that's the change. And I don't want to become like, it's okay. Again, <laughs> you're doing fine. But, but, <laughs> I think that's where also we're, we're going to have a better attitude towards the horse, you know, and, and because we're not the center. I mean, the horse is the horse, you know, we didn't invent it, you know. So I think we need to be kind of kinder to, to those animals, you know, and, 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 and reasonable also, you know, so, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And that's, um, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner. I've trained for over 16 years on the method and Feldenkrais was an engineer. And so right. he studied the human body and he looked at the bones and said, there's 5,000 possible ways of combining them. And we only use like 800 when we get out of school, right? right. And riding, you know, and in horses to perform, they need all these possibilities. And so it's our job to make sure that we can do those movements, they can do those movements, and we set them up 
to achieve their potential by making sure we take care of all these different factors, feet, teeth, back, saddle, rider, nutrition, health, um, to make that whole. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, and I think when we do that, we become better people too. It's synergistic. The horse gets better, we get better, you know, it, it helps every, every, all the creatures. So anyway, you want me to start with the, yeah. the talk? Yeah, okay. Great. So. I'm just going to check I'm that doing it. I'm doing it on Facebook Live. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to start. So this is this is what I do. This is one of the horse I, I rescued. Um, it, it, it's a one dollar horse that that had all sorts of stuff. So it leaves at my place. I mean, she lives at my place forever. <laughs> uh, they were going to kill her when I got her. So there you go. Oh wow, um, gorgeous. Yeah. It, well, it, 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 I will blog on her. It's it's an interesting story. Anyway, so what is Epona Mind? Um, we have Metron, a software that's been around for 20 years and we keep adding up stuff. Uh, we have Epona Shoe that I invented for, for my own self and use. And we're not necessarily just a shoe company, so it's part of the thing we do. And I, of course, because I'm a nerd, um, I do quite a bit of research and I'm published and I keep coming up with stuff that maybe commercially and not necessarily the, the most the, the the best thing to do but it's fun <laughs> so um and you know the, the whole idea about all the talk i have is based on really taking good images and also you know uh, using scale marker for calibration because when people have all this data and images and they don't calibrate correctly or they don't know how to take good images it, it doesn't give you the right number so that's quite important i'm a little bit of a stickler with that and I see a lot of this, you know, I do post it on, on Facebook and otherwise. So those are stuff that are sent to us. It's not gleaned from Facebook. But, um, you know, it's taking a little bit willy-nilly and people may comment on things, you know, um, that actually you, you can't assess anything because you don't have a way to calibrate or the, the pictures have not been taken correctly. So it, 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 it's a false read. So it's very important to, um, whoops. It's very important to measure correctly. This is why uh, we invented um, a block so I can always calibrate correctly uh, the image I have. And you have to know how to take how to take um, uh, pictures. You probably none of you are taking X-rays, but we, we do have a, a software that analyzes uh, um, radiographs, uh, not just for horses, but for small animal, humans, and the military. So. Um, here we go. So, you know, you can do a lot of things with our software. You can take x-rays, put the x-ray into a pictures. You can do morphs, you know, and everything is calibrated correctly, meaning the numbers are real. So why is calibration important? Uh, if, you, if you take a simple scale marker just at the front of the images, it's not accurate because the true length is not going to be the same as the length when you actually take to, to the middle of, of, for instance, the block or the middle of a, uh, of the image so it's very important that you calibrate correctly uh, it makes actually it will introduce mistake if it's not calibrated correctly you can see one has a 1.08 and one is 1.27 so you know if you do especially if you do research you can't have that um, again how you take your images can be very different it's the same hoof 13 second apart and most people would agree they don't look quite the same so, and I see that a lot on Facebook. You have a lot of those pictures and people are commenting um, and I can tell this is, this is not quite working right. So is anyone having a question? Uh, not at this moment. Somebody's raised their hand, but I'm going to just ask them. So I, I, it's easier for me to manage if you put your question in okay. the chat rather than raising your hand. Um, but we're happy to take questions. So if anybody has one, just let me just put it in the chat. And then when it's appropriate, I'll, I'll interrupt Monique and ask her the question. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go through that very fast. I mean, that, that's not the point of this talk. But, you know, again, everything we have done and I present in the talk, I've, I've done under a very method, methodical way to measure. And a few universities have tested what we have done. We have a lot of people who have done their PhD with our software. So it's been kind of wet, wetted over, over the years as far as the mean of taking accurate measurement, all right? So, um, you know, and again, 
we we do AI, so I have I, I I have really a lot of images. This is nothing. Two thousand six hundred is still nothing for us. I have close to a million on some on some thing we were trying to to train for into artificial intelligence. Uh, but the more the, the more the your your data set, the better the better the trends you're going to find. So it's kind of good to have large data to 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 make me with correct measurements, so you can see trends. All right. So let, let's go to the main talk here, which is about the hoof plasticity, and I will explain why it's plas it has plasticity. Um, so the hoof can change quite a bit. This is the same hoof in 15 months, and you can you can see how it can morph itself quite a bit. You know, this is one type of shoe, another type of shoe A, and one type of shoe B, another type of shoe B, C is barefoot, uh, D is with a composite shoe. And you can tell, I mean, the hoof will go through a lot of changes and uh, I will explain why. Um, so people tend to kind of understand that hoof can change. People with trim horses, they see it, they touch a foot, they change. But um, they, it has plasticity because you have biomaterial that can respond to shear and forces. Uh, also the, the, the hoof, and that's very important, it's a, it, the, 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 the strata of the hoof that people think, think about and touch is a, a keratinized part of the of the hoof, but it, it, it like everything, it has plasticity. Uh, and also you have to keep in mind, this is a three-dimensional structure that is asymmetric, I will go into that later. And um, again, it has to be able to deform to a certain extent, otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll have problem. And in, in the case of, of the stratum corneum, which is, which is your, your hard um, hoof, um, you 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 have a very very complex form. Uh, it's it's the, the architecture is quite amazing. I mean, I call it a, a composite material on steroids. But don't repeat me. So anyway, and another thing, you know, the skin responds to physical stimulus, which turn is co it's converted in biochemical biochemical responses, and that's where mechanobiology is quite interesting. It's a new field, but it's very important. All right, so I'm not going to go into that, but I want people to get the concept. So just to, to brush over what, what we have, like the proteins are very strong and I call structural proteins, keratin, elastin. So in keratin, you have your, in our case, it's the, the, the horn the, of the hoof and, and the hoof, your hair, of course, skin and fur. Um, elastin has connect, connective tissue with arteries, ligaments, Collagen, you know, it's amazing because it's where the tendons are and everything. And it's actually uh, um, uh, stronger than steel, gram for gram. Amazing, but true. So, uh, but of course the structure is very different. Uh, you know, we don't have to go into that, but this is a, the, the, the fiber of an elastic fiber. You can see it's kind of, can stretch and non-stretch and it's cross-linked. So, whoops. And um, I have elastin collagen. Collagen is different type. Again, it has its own mechanical property. Um, it's very interesting because everything is kind of designed a little bit in coil and, and it's bonded with, uh, with uh, um, um, either hydrogen bond in the keratin and other things like disulfate bond, but again, another story. So this is probably the one that is the most interesting for people is the alpha, alpha helix of the, of the keratin. And the keratin keep coiling, coiling, coiling. Uh, at the lowest level, you, you have the alpha helix and it has um, hydrogen bond in between. And after that, you have disulfate bond and you create kind of that filament. And it's like a cloth. It can create either your nail or it can create the, the, the horn of the hoof, the architecture. But you have basically that, that uh, protofibrils that create, create a cloth. It's like weaving, okay? So what's very important with the keratin uh, hydrogen bonds it's in moisture. It, it does not quite always like moisture. So, and it also it use moisture it, it, to, to self-regulate, to regulate um, uh, its, its strength. So the more the di dice of um, hydrogen bond between the, the, the lowest level of the, of the keratin, your, your um, molecules, you, you, do have, you do have more hydrogen bonds when you want more stiffness. You have less hydrogen bonds when you want something to be a little bit more flexy. When the hydrogen bonds completely fail, which is very bad, then, then you go to a beta carotene, which is a very different structure. 
But in general, that's how nature knows how to modulate itself in terms of tensile strengths and, and, and um, uh, in the hoof. So I'll, I'll show that to you later. But um, for me, the, nature is amazing. That's where, <laughs> if you take material science, you know, you know it's complicated. We create a plywood to, to, to strengthen material. But we have to think the, 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 the wall in architecture, it's basically a plywood that is reinforced by a mesh. The mesh coming from, from the coronary band and, and um, uh, it goes down and then it goes across, across this, 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 this plywood. You can change direction. So your tubules that come from the coronary band go through this plywood-like material. This is a schematic. It's not as well structured, but it's, it's the ID. So it's meant to um, uh, fight cracks and uh, it's pretty well designed. So it's quite amazing because it's not very thick actually, but it's very complex in structure. So the, the hoof, hoof wall structure, which is, for me, it's amazing. I could spend hours on that. So you, you have your corium here and you start having your, your, your hard keratin, but as you go closer to soft tissue, um, the keratin uh, itself, the tubules are, are much more softer. And it makes sense because if it was hard, it would break. So it modulates its, its stiffness, its hardness, uh, as it goes from soft to hard. When you go towards the outside, um, it, it's, it's much harder. And it's in microns, it's very small actually. Um, and it changes also structure because you have a little bit rounder towards, towards the um, uh, soft tissue with more, more moisture content. And uh, you, you get a little more oblong when you go towards the outside of the wall, which most people is where actually people with thought thinning wall. And people should be a little bit careful how much they thin because, again, the, the wall is designed to fight, fight cracks. Um, so this is a micron, electron microscope uh, view of this plywood material. So that's your tubules going through, and then you have a change of direction. So it's, it, as I say, quite amazing. So imagine a, a piece of plywood these little holes drill through, which would be your tubules, okay? So you change direction in the, in the, in the plywood so it becomes strong, but it's reinforced with that cold fiber-like, uh, it's, it's the same material, but it's, it's, it helps actually with the shearing forces and everything. Can I, I ask that. one question? Um, yes. If go back two slides, um, I'm a geek. <laughs> one more. Oops. Go back. One more. Yeah, there. How did you take these pictures? Is this? Oh, I uh, didn't take that. It's from uh, Dr. Kasapi and Ghostline. This, it's called Design, Design Complexity and, and Fracture Control in Equine Hoof. So you can draw the paper. or Someone can send me a, an email. I'll send you the paper. Okay. Awesome. So the, the, I used the, to do no, a lot of need... histology. So when I see the slides like that, it brings back my old, uh, old career. <laughs> Well, I mean, you see, this is where people have to, and th th for me, this is where nature is amazing because it truly, as far as if you do comparative biology, the stratum corneum in any mammal, the one of the horse hoof wall is the most complex in architecture. And you know, if you really think about it, it makes sense because it's weight bearing, it has to, it, it's, it's protecting one digit that, that has to deal with sheer force banging, the, the soil, everything. And I think nature has done an amazing job um, creating creating material like that, you know? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So absolutely. anyway, like, yeah. So it, it's really cool. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm geeking um, out. I'm a scientist. You know, I'm the scientist by training and uh, I yeah. spent a long time, but I still geek out on that stuff. <laughs> yeah. This, the, the, I think, you know, and that makes us humble because I think we couldn't come up with something like that by ourselves if we were to design a horse from scratch, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, if you look at the, at the hoof, you, you will have the moisture de decrease as it comes from inside to the outside of the hoof. And the, it's, it's wetter always towards the top, a little bit more moist in the back, which I don't, didn't show because it's softer. Because all this material has to stay softer as it goes towards the, the, the bottom part of the hoof you, you can see it gets harder and harder, all right? Do, do that make sense? Yep. Yeah, okay. So again, the, the, the increased moisture decreases uh, bonding of, of the hydrogen bond, and, and, uh, you know, and then you can increase and decrease it depending where, which area of the hoof you're at and what you need uh, mechanically. So, um, you know, and the, 
I will not attack the, the metal, metal shoes, uh, but there's a reality. No one used to get very upset before when you would say, well, a shot of horse is in metal is not the same as a barefoot foot. When I was a kid, no one, no one used to faint when you said that. Now you have to be very careful, depending which group you are on, uh, uh, we are going to insult, right? So the, the hoof is made of some natural mechanical property you cannot change, you know, and when you put something like a foreign object on, on, on the hoof, um, you're, you're changing things for better or worse, you know? So you need to have something that is more synergetic with the mechanical property of the horn versus something that is not. And, and, and there's complexity with the trimming, understanding what you trim for, blah, 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 et cetera. But the, the reality, you know, materials have mechanical properties and you better kind of try to find something that gets closer to that, you know, and at least to, to not have problem. That's why. And well, and I think I it's a testament to the horse that he has been shot in metal shoes for what, hundreds or thousands? I mean, when was the first shoe yeah. created? And yet well, he, they, they had shoes already, you know, probably uh, uh, 2,500 years ago, or even earlier, you know, when you look at Sisian horses, because they used to wrap them in, in leather and other things. But the, the, the metal shoe became widespread only when the iron ores were non-expensive. So it's probably uh, 1,000, you know, uh, uh, after Christ, that, that's probably Middle Age. That's why really, really widespread everywhere. Even so, there was already metal shoes before, but it was expensive. So horses kind of were kept barefoot as much as they could. And, and, that's and the that. horses so, are able, have, have been managed to adapt to that and still yeah. do what we ask for a thousand years. I think that's a testament to the horse. Well, I, I think, you know, also that, that, that it's not something I approach in this uh, discussion, but I think we were breeding horses for working and they were tougher than what we're breeding right now because the, the, it, we're breeding horses for, especially in, 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 in the West, you know, we're breeding horses for, for uh, entertainment, you know, for our pleasure. It's not meant to really be a workhorse, you know. So I, I think we've changed horses so radically because of single use, like just for dressage or jumping or endurance, you do not have a well-rounded horse anymore, you know. So I think they're more fragile. Um, I have a friend, who, who, uh, Bernard Duvernay, that has uh, a school in, in India to, to help uh, privilege, under, underprivileged people and doing better uh, care for animals. And um, he, is, is, he always is surprised as a farrier, because he's a farrier in Europe, how tougher those horses are in, in India and other places where, you know, they're bred for work. I mean, I said most of our horses would probably pass out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the stuff they have on their feet and those guys go and run around and do their thing so you know not saying we should abuse horses but it yeah well we're, we're, we're also breeding wimpy horses you know so it comes down to to you know again going back to the young models and, and stencil strengths this is what engineers do when you study biomaterial and you know it's it's a logarithmic scale of 10 which is quite big and look at the hoof by itself you know it's quite quite different whether it's when it's not, not uh, wet or uh, very dry, it, it, the stiffness gets stronger, the tensile strength. So you you have you have already quite a big change. But when you look at steel and aluminium, it's really far away, and uh, so is plywood. So it, it's better to put something that is synergetic to a foot uh, versus steel and aluminium. You know, look at the Nike we have and all those things. You know, and now no one would go back. Uh, you know, uh, running a, a, a an endurance. Uh, 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 race with with uh, with uh, wooden shoes, you know that would not happen, you know. So um, the the thing is, what is also very important, and I'm I'm not going into the dialogue of whether the foot is suspended, the the, the coffin bone is suspending by by tissue, or it's it's the the, the frog and the, the digital cushion that is doing that. What I want to point out is out of uh, Dr. Chris Pollock's book. Um, again, you you have collage collagen. A collagen bundle that tie into the corium and um, all that has tensile strengths and and I think it needs to stay very healthy and some horses who do not have actually good collagen bundle will have more uh, bone loss over time because the mechanical property of those those tissue might be weak or they have problems so I'm not talking about laminitis um, so I think also the question is also what breeding horses you know and what demanding horses 
a single use, what I call single use horses, like only dressage or only jumping or whatever. And what the meaning of horses are grow, growing to, to start working way, way, way too soon. Mm -hmm. And I personally, mm -hmm. that's, you don't have to quote me, but I think there is also starting of damage of bones and everything pretty young, either also due to conformation, but also starting horses uh, too young and you're starting having active failure in tissues. You know, they're very crucial, like the co collagen bundle, because they're under stress, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's my take on that, but you don't have to repeat my, my little take. So um, again, people have to connect with the horse hoof capsule, the hard hoof capsule, as your skin. Even so, it's a stratum corneum, and it has a very incredible uh, architecture. It is, it is skin. The, the hoof is skin. It's a very specialized skin, but it's important to remember it's skin. And skin can can obviously do things, deform, stretch, and do all sorts of stuff. So um, this is why I like to study all the things like comparative anatomy, and I try to get other other articles, you know, and see how they means that was a good article about the journal. The, I think this was can be pulled out the Journal of Investigative, uh, Investigative Dermatology. It's about you know how um, the the mechanosensing affect how, for instance, your, your keratocyte and everything kind of start um, behaving and where they, 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 they proliferate. Very important to understand that because positioning the capsule around the, the bone articulation will also help all those cells to propagate in the right, right, the right place, okay? And that's not been proven with the horse feet, but it is proven uh, through, through the, uh, the, the Dermatology uh, magazine and everything, because mechanobiology is becoming very important. Dr. Bowker and Dr. Isabel and Dr. Lancaster have written a book and uh, a paper about the mor morphological evolution of the uh, Merkel cells and, and sensory receptor in the equine foot. You can you can pull that out. I pointed out to people a long time ago that the hoof capsule is it wood or skin because people treat it like this is this inert thing. And I, I kind of cringe sometimes because, you know, when you understand the architecture of the capsule, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's dead cells, but it's, it's quite important to, to think it's still skin and you can't just go willy-nilly into it just, just because it's called dead. Um, so again, everything in, 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 in the world uh, uh, behave, uh, respond to mechanical, mechanical forces. This is true for, for, for your, your keratinized soul. This is true for any tissue. So you, in the capsule itself, because that's what we're interested in, you will have some shear and repeated shear and forces that actually will cause the material to stretch and elongate somewhat. And it doesn't necessarily come back to the exact shape. You know, if you look at your tennis shoes, you have worked, used for a long time, you can see how your feet actually have pushed or you, the motion of your legs have pushed those shoes one way or the other, you know, and that's kind of normal. So the idea of trimming is to kind of reduce material creep to a point where you're going to create problem like, you know, wall failures and other things. So it's quite important to understand those concepts. Um, so that's just to show you what could happen. This is not a real thing, but you have the pedal bone and, you know, the capsule itself, this is just showing you the soul can actually you know, creep around that pedal bone. And often that's why you, go, you get flare, you get things. On worse situation, you would have hoof, hoof wall separation when it's very extreme. So your ID, your ID when you trim is to actually maintain the capsule, you know, around that pedal bone correctly, because otherwise you're, 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 you're going to increase those problems, right? So that's, that's very important. Um, so, you know, myself, I do not like, you know, for me, the, the put, putting a bar across this, I, it's useless because, you know, the wall is designed to actually stop cracks. So you already have a crack and then you, you, you put a big gash in the middle of it. I don't think it's going to help a lot. And I've seen often it does actually create bigger cracks and bigger problem. Often it's, a, it's actually a trimming issue and, and a lack of support and loading issue. But sometimes you have to dremel if you have an infection in the hoof. Uh, white line disease you need to cure so that's different but that for me is not very useful okay that's that's a wife's tale um 
what you have to understand also with healing uh, uh, cracks or anything, uh, it, it will heal obviously from the inside out. So the better you trim, the more you support the weight, uh, it will heal pretty fast. And I'm not saying you should not sometimes clean up all this stuff, and, but if you don't have to start make it big, making a bigger gash, you're better off, okay? Not doing it if you can. Um, I don't have the morph, so there you go. Uh, this is a, <laughs> and whoever wants to buy Frisian, think twice. Um, so this is a Frisian I worked on and he had a, a, a dermatitis and, and they're pretty prone to that. So it's not the fonder or laminitis episode. It's really wall, wall failure here due to weight and, and nutrition issue and they have, they have problems genetically. So, you know, again, a lot of people would have cut more in the front. What I do is lower the heel, then I can take more toes. So whatever is crafty in the, you have to cure it. You have to cure it, you have to do whatever you have to do, make sure you clean that. But if you lower the heel, like in this case, it's too much, you have more toe in the front, so you can take some wall, and I don't have to start cutting too high um, and start damaging the foot. So that was like in, uh, I think in July, that was in beginning of December, that was in May the following year, and that was a year later, the horse managed to be okay. So same thing. Again, yeah. high yeah. heel, lower the heel, you can actually you project the toe forward, you can chop some of the stuff off, and eventually the foot the foot kind of recuperate quite nicely. Um, so moisture and soil and exfoliation process, all right. As you understand now that the keratin respond to also uh, hydrogen bond, and if you have too much moisture, it will it will actually weaken weaken the, the keratin at the uh, molecular level. Uh, it it is not as bad on the wall because of its structure, because it's it's a fly, plywood uh, reinforced uh, by a mesh. But the sole in general, probably it's, it's, it's not the same. It's pure plywood. It, you do not have a fiber going all the way through the sole, but it seems to be a little bit more sensitive. And um, this is the same hoof when it's really bone dry, very wet, it's me trimming. So all of a sudden I'm like, what? And then while, while you support the weight. So myself, I like to see not a huge distance between the heel to the bulb. And um, I obviously don't want huge amount of toe, but that's not the toe length that is an issue. It's really, here it's the sagging. So when the foot starts sagging because it got wet, you do have problem. And note that not every horses do that. Some horses have weaker bar and um, they, they tend to be a little bit more sensitive to moisture. Some horses are not actually. So it's not black and white, but um, that's kind of nice to look at that. So, um, you know, again, everyone should look at the environment. Me, I, I live in an arid area. We have pretty much grass for, oh, for four months, five months maybe. And then, then it's bone dry and we're on Adobe. It's extremely hard. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of changing the function of the foot because of the environment you live in. So it, it will also change the, the, the wear pattern of the foot quite a bit. Um, and you have to bear in mind, uh, you have a lot of soil. You have a lot of different types of soil, and it will affect also how the, the, the hoof wear itself. You know, if, a, if you have a more sandy area, you're not going to have the, the same cuppiness. You know, on a sandy area, it's probably more cuppy than, for instance, when you have a, a more adobe-like like ground, which they tend to kind of keep a little bit more retaining soil and they tend to be flat, flatter because you have that retaining soil that stay there. So the, the way you look at the foot underneath, and even, I mean, I'm talking a barefoot foot, is very dependent of the conformation, the moisture content, and also the soil they travel over. So it's a little dangerous to try to make every hoof look the same because, you know, you have some some guru that lives in a sandy area and another person that lives somewhere else and everyone debate what what things should look like it really depends so, um, so, so Moni, can i interrupt you here because we have a question that i think kind of fits in um someone's asked um like in michigan it's there's it's swampy and so how do you manage horses that are turned out in wet conditions or are is there some way to balance the moisture within the foot so that well I, I think you know the, there's 
again, you have to, and I'm not going into the morphology of the feet and the bars and the whole thing this time, but I would have a dry lot because, you know, you, you moisture in the hoof, unless they're bred and adapted there, we bring horses like, that. Then, you know, they're not adapted to your area because it's a different breed or I don't know what horses type of horse you have. So having a dry lot where you can actually let your horse stand under an area that is dry and it, and it could be 20 by 60, maybe half a day when you have the worst, the worst of the worst of the moisture can help a lot. Uh, there are there are material also you can put on the hoof, I mean, um, to, to, to toughen up the hoof. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be careful because the bigger the hoof the, and the, the, the bigger the horse and the more, you know, the gated the horse, you know, and all these things, it's hard on the hoof because it comes back to those collagen bundle that comes from um, the, the, um, uh, <laughs> the, the third phalange onto the, the corium. Uh, you know, if you put, keep putting that on the stress and you have a foot that starts playing, you're going to also do damage to the pedal bone. And I will come down, down to that because we've done some research about that. So I think a, a dry lot would be actually a nice thing. It's, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, and find a place you can put a little bit of DG and, and keep your horses once in a while when you have the worst of the worst of the muddy season. And that can help a lot. Okay? And, um, like, are you... Uh, just to, just to kind of follow that up a little bit. So if I was to build a dry lot, I would want, and I was in a really wet condition, how many hours a day would I want to make sure that he's in that dry lot? It depends on what it is. You know, if it's super wet, I would keep them half a day in there. Okay. Or I, I you know, the evening, bring them in, keep them in during the night, you know, and, and Gotta that have would be, a of yeah. where the foot dries out. Yeah, we have to give it a chance to dry out. It's, it's a nice management, maybe not the best for the horse because, you know, they should be roaming all the time. But, you know, I, I have horses that do have lo lo the mare you see running at the beginning of, uh, of my presentation. If she's in the wet too long, I mean, I, I, it's a disaster for her. I, I, it just doesn't work because she's heavy. She had a few issues. And I, in the winter, I have to be really careful. You know, and it's per horse, per situation, um, you know, not one, one solution fits a, a, a everything, you know. So you have to look at, the, at what you're dealing with, okay? Okay. And, and you know, there are horses in the Camargue, they're, they're bred and they are, they are always in the wet. They are, they are running in, in, in salt water, in the marshes and everything, and they don't seem to have huge problem like that. Their feet actually are half decent, you know. So it really depends on, on the breed and, and, and where they're at. Okay. Yep. Another thing, because someone was wondering about the food and other things, you know, and, and cracks in the wall. Um, you, you know, I, I cannot recommend what type of food you should supplement or, or to help the foot because it comes down to the, the soil and every state has a different soil. So you, you might be deficient in selenium in one place, not if I have too much in another place or have too much calcium or it depends what you feed. My, my, my take on that is to work with a, 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 a good nutritionist and someone that understand also soil and you should have your, your soil tested and you should have um, uh, your nutrition tested. Uh, a little thing also, which I learned just recently, gotta be very careful with alfalfa because it's GMO and it's ready for, for glyphosate. Glyphosate actually seemed to um, upset the balance of calcium phosphorus uh, in the feed. So wherever you're feeding alfalfa, if, if, if it's try to buy non-GMO or, or stay away from it if you can um, and, and be very careful. You know, be careful what, what, what um, cut you get of alfalfa or what cut you get of the grass because if, the, the, for instance, the grass lay on the ground too long, we're going to have also more sugar. So, you know, you need to work with someone in your area, uh, talk about, about um, what, 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 what the soil and what's in the food and everything. And as far as cracks goes, you know, you could have superficial cracks on horses, but it's maybe a little bit of too much moisture at one time. It dries up too fast not necessarily bad and deep. Um, cracks that are done through loading, like I saw, saw the Frisian, uh, you know, the, the horses that breed that are notorious to have, I mean, white line disease, you know, and it also genetics or, or because they have tendency to have dermatitis and other problems. So, um, 
you know, cellulite is, for instance. So you, 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 you need to kind of figure out what is what, okay? So, right? so if I was to kind of sum this up, see if I've got it right. Um, we have these, these bonds in the foot that are affected by moisture that in, right. in a wet environment, now the foot is going to be softer and it can't support, like if you have a really big horse, it, it's going to have a hard time supporting the weight. We're going to see the foot shape right. change. But there's also a lot of other things going on if we start to see that like your mare and that we really have to manage not only our moisture, but we, we have to manage our environment, our feed and the quality of that and in our local environment because there are so many varied environments. And as we try to keep our horses more and more in a natural way outside, they're getting more of their feed from their environment. So we really have to balance all their hay with their grain with the with the minerals like my horse has to have selenium because we're selenium deficient but right. every area is unique i mean you look at this map and it's so obvious that there are so many different environments that there's no one size fits all you really have to look at your local environment and your local moisture conditions and tailor your program to fit where you are right and and you know you'll see i'll, I'll show you i had the horse that i mean that's my 32 and i half year old horse that that live a long time and he had it you know he's a thoroughbred and he had like teflon feet with everything so i think my husband is pointing at me i'm talking too much all right let's go no, you're doing great <laughs> this is fabulous because ah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway let's let's continue so you know this is a global view of, of the soil look at it's even more more intense you know so uh, you you can tell you have different stuff so anyway why is asymmetry can be beautiful? Well, again, some asymmetries are not good, some are good because they are naturally innate to, to the system. And it's very hard because I think the hoof being asymmetric, it, it, it creates all those discussion am, among people. And that's my, I like my little perception of the world, you know, on the, on the person on the left, on, on, the, on the left was say four and the other one <laughs> say three. But we all do that, you know, we all do that. It depends on what pers perspective you look at, at things. So, you know, it's not an attack. I think it's, it's difficult, you know? So, yeah. you know, the, the, the hoof is, is asymmetric. So meaning the solar view of the foot is slightly wider on the lateral side than the medial side. It's very slight. And some horses have a very splayed foot, like some of those big uh, draft horses, they're pretty symmetric, but in general, it, it, it's on, on the wider side, on the lateral side than the, 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 the medial, okay? So again, the, the asymmetry doesn't mean it's, it's, it's misshapen, it's, it's innate to the, to, to, to the system. And some are actually true asymmetries that, you know, you, you have done pat, patterning with uh, uh, the Feldenkrais, the things are actually not, not good asymmetries, they're bad. So, you know, but in the, in the case of morphology, you do have asymmetries that are normal, okay? That's what I'm looking at. Um, so we, we, we did some statistics, and I have more, but I just, just one, we plunked a paper just recently. Um, so I, I 500 hoof, and I don't find a lot of horses with 50-50. Now, the average is, as I say, not enormous, but it's 48.9. So, you know, what does it mean to someone that trims and wants to trim for symmetry? And, and you see that in a lot of books, they, they bisect the foot across the frog and between the frog and it's all symmetry. Um, so, you know, that we did more stuff and it's still 48.8. Um, so that's just a little visual for you to see. I, I digitize a soul and I forgot to remove the bottom part, but that's okay. It's so okay. Um, you, you, get, you get the drift. And that would be your sole minus the wall, and you can really see it. It's definitely asymmetric. All right. And this is very so reassuring because I, as I've been doing these webinars, I I do my own horse's feet, and um, I've been looking at them more and more closely, and I'm like, they're not symmetrical. And now I realize they're not supposed to be. They're not supposed to be, and you'll see why. And and actor is there's way more to it than this because. I just happened to digitize 360 uh, legs uh, up, to, up to the carpal and the torso. And I can tell you, we find, well, I'm gonna do some statistic. We, we find some very interesting stuff though, but now I'm staying just for the, the basic stuff. So, you know, it's very interesting because I don't know where the, the symmetry 
started to become such a big deal because in all German books, and even when I grew up, you know, you had the left and right pattern metal shoes. You didn't have both, both feet being completely symmetric. Same thing with the height, which is strange. So something changed because I think maybe we don't have as many horses and people have, you know, we have less fires or less whatever, or people have lost their, their mind. <laughs> I don't know. Or when you start to mass produce shoes, it's easier to make them symmetrical. I, exactly. So, but none of the books, and I have more books actually that I'm getting, uh, show symmetries on the older, older books. So I, I think it's quite interesting. So people knew that. I'm not inventing this. Um, so it's just, this is what you can do with our software. I can deform a whole capsule. Oh, wow. This is exa exaggerated. You, you, can, you can turn it in 3D, in 3D so... You know, but anyway, but that gives you an idea that that's obviously will be too extreme and very bad, but you get the idea. So, and it's not an attack and, and I apologize because I don't know where this picture come from. So I'm not attacking that, uh, but it's very natural for humans. You know, that's, that's how we, we gauge beauty actually. The psychologists have done studies on that, that the more the face is going towards symmetry, the more people think you're beautiful. So I think we have something with humans to, to, to think that symmetry is normal, you know? I, I, I think that's the, way, that's the way we're wired, but mm -hmm. you know, they're definitely not bisecting in the middle with the same on one side and the other, medial or lateral, you know, it just doesn't happen. So they, here I am, you know, <laughs> I'm having a fetal position, having a nervous breakdown about why everything wants to be symmetric. So, um, so let's look at the bone. All right, and we did study also of bones. So if you're, that, that's just to show you, I'll show you the statistic later. Um, you, you do not have a symmetrical bone. You know, the lateral side is not as steep as the medial side. Again, you have bone that's so damaged and demineralized, they will be perfectly symmetric, but that's not the norm. Another thing is when you trim, you have um, a, a less steep angle on the lateral side when people start cleaning he heels than the medial side. So it's, it, it will have a question why do why everyone wants to to have everything symmetric so when they trim it's, it's, it's a long story here I, I will go to it later but look at the look at the look at the pedal bones and they're all a little bit different even in a bright pedal bone like this one versus the flatter one you you do not find symmetry right so and and what we fitted and we did some research on on just computerized fitting curve we we we, we fitted the three parameter ellipse and that's what it turned out to be. So I'm going to show you that. And we did a bunch of them and we found that it's not on the average, it's not again, symmetric. The, the solar solar aspect of the pedal bone is not symmetric. Uh, so, you know, and, and another thing that was my pet peeve, uh, does, does the apex of the Karanatized frog match the apex of the, the, the live frog? And we did also a little study long time ago uh, where we really did clean the soul like i would never clean a normal animal like that but you could do, do really good shiny tissue on the karenitis part of the soul to and then we remove the the karenitis part of the soul and then we we drill another hole at the end of the uh, um i mean karenitis like frog and and uh, we drilled a, a hole at the, um, on both sides on 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 the frog and on the the, um, the live frog and they do not match, right? And I've done barefoot horses that do not match. And you know, it makes sense because every horse is locomate very differently and tissue will shear. And I think the frog and all the things shear with it even under the best conditions. So you can't expect to have those tissue matching perfectly correct, okay? Hope I'm making sense. Yep. Um, so there, there, is, there, there is a few paper we got out you know, and uh, this is the latest one. We just presented a, a, a paper with Dr. Malone of Rockford University. I have, a, I have a few one that went, but I don't know where it's going because no one is going to conference right now. So, yeah. and you know, again, like everything, pedal bones are very different. And everyone thinks the pedal bones have this nice little copy. And no, they, they are a little bit more, this one is more upright, there's more vertical depth on this pedal bone, but you do not have that perfect cuppiness, neither does this one, because those are related to loading issue over time, and you will have a little bit of, of you know, 
valley flatness and it's, those are loading issues that remodel the pedal bone, right? It's not necessarily bad, but it happens. Um, so again, it's, it's hard for people to, to visualize things because I don't think it's that trivial to trim because of, of all the aspect of the foot not being symmetric. And, and I think when you have to start trimming it, 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 you have to change your mind and start thinking in, in those terms of asymmetry. Otherwise you can send the, the capsule in the wrong place. Um, you know, it's not enough to just remove the, the toe lengths and bring the heel back and have the, 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 the sole body under the bony column. You, you really have to kind of orient that, that foot correctly. Um, so that's my ex thorn right? is he's gone now, but he had Teflon feet and even he was pretty upright, was not, was not symmetric, all right? And that's also a little study we have, you know, on the average between the medial lateral side, you have a, a 2.3 degrees uh, in terms of a wall angle, okay, medial lateral. Um, and that's normal, you know, and it depends on the horse. Again, it's, it's basically the shape of the pedal bone on a good foot will also, the, the wall will be kind of similar to the shape of uh, the pedal bone, all right? So the danger with not, we, 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 not understanding this, this different angles is like people are going to start taking more on the lateral wall than the medial wall because you have different, different uh, lengths. But to your eyes, if you think it's completely symmetric, you're going to make mistake when you trim. So you're very slowly going to tip the foot to the lateral side. Um, and that's not necessarily good. And, and again, the sole plane is debatable, but you get the idea. Another, the long pastern, I do more, more stuff to it, but that's just very, very quick. Um, it's an asymmetric bone. Every time I look at an x-ray, I can always tell if it's without uh, any label on it, whether it's a medial or lateral, because in general, it's very general, it's much more curvy on the lateral side than, than the medial side. Plus you have a tilt uh, at the, at, um, on, the, on the phalange, okay? It's tilted, so it's not, it's not a, a totally flat pedal bone, a flat uh, joint right there. Um, that's kind of how you would fit fit um, circles and find the kinematics of the joint. So the tilt on on this bone is about you know four four point two five degrees, and that's the amount of bone we found, and it's not zero. Uh, so that's just food for thought. And the danger is, and I've seen that happening, that people are trying to match that articulation to find a flat flat line with the top. So they're going to start taking more on one side or the other. To align all this thing straight and that's really bad and um, it can't be so you know the hoof display a lot of uh, uh, asymmetries which are normal and you should really try to work to not let that food fool your eyes all right so we have another thing we we this is in our software um, we we have a way to look at the concavity of the pe pedal bone or cuppiness uh, because the pedal bones are not the same and it's very important. You know, if you have a flat pedal bone, you don't necessarily want to put the six degree wedge pad on it when, when it's flat as a pancake because it's already remodeled. So um, that little line shows you this, the, the part of the bone that is more radio opaque. So yeah, I can show you that. You see, this, this is the most radio opaque area because that has to be the strongest because this is where you dip your flexor tendon tied to. So you, you can trace that. And then what we did, we did a little statistic of dropping this down from the extensor process and at the end, the end of the pedal bone and uh, find what we call the Palmer curve. And that gives me a percentage and I can see how much the, the metric is. So in this case, it's 13.1. Some horses are almost zero, which is really bad. So but what we found that was interesting after looking at a lot of bones and now we have more, as the horse aged, it seems that uh, palmar metric, meaning the vertical depth of the, of the pedal bone, start dropping. And not all horses do it, but there's a trend going towards going down. And you know, I think gravity always wins. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's quite important. And I, I, my advice to people when they buy a young horse is to measure that palmar metric, because especially if you are bringing a horse to a very hard area like us, you do want to have a little bit more vertical depth in your pedal bone. Do, do I make sense? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to catch up because John is giving, my husband is right watching me, giving me the eye. 
but I'm it's okay. Here. We go over all the time. It was two hours the other day in the bone room. It's totally fine. <laughs> okay, because he knows I digress. That's why in general, he does not let me use the, uh, the, the computer so I can move on. No, this is great. Worry. We're doing great. Everyone is worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, again, why do I have the bone reference trim? This is, this is very important because the hoof will distort any which way. It can shear, it, even on the foot that is under the bony column, that is barefoot, locomotional changes happen. And we, you know, like you know that in humans, no humans um, move the same and we have, we have flaws. So we affect the way we land, period, you know? So of course, when you land over a material that, that is supposed to support you, it can shear, torque, do all, the, all sorts of things. So I don't trust what I see past, past the, 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 the first, first inch and a half around the coronary band. Not that I ignore it, but I don't trust it. So this is why I do orthogonal projection from, from um, I, I'll explain that. The, the, those are not the Dave Duckett dots. Those are actually, and I'm not trying to, to take anyone's work away from people. It's the articular area of the joints of that project onto the sole to see how actually the, the tissue have sheared. I mean, the, the, the keratin has sheared, tissue shear with it too. So you'll, you'll see about what I'm talking about. So that would be kind oh. of a normal horse. And, and that way I can always gauge actually how that capsule has, has twisted around the bone, okay? So it's okay. very important. And since I cannot spread myself thinner than I am right now, I came up with a, a gauge so I don't have to teach people as much. Oops, they can redo it at home without me because it's a little bit short of time. So we can do that now with this gauge. I can palpate the spine uh, and then you can, you, and there's a second gauge that go with it because you can't always palpate the, the point around the corner band. And that way you can actually see, this is a nice hoof. So you don't have a problem, um, but you can see actually where 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 the points are in the relationship. I don't know something is missing here. Here, so there you go. So I can tell you know this is normal. It's slightly wider on the, on the lateral side than the the medial, and I can find exactly where the breakover the breakover where the horse has broken over naturally. This guy has acted as a really good foot. Okay, not every horse is do that. So that one is nice. So this is what I do. I put the two points here and then I project it down and I can see where the, the that, that tells me where the articulation is in relationship of, of the, 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 the sole aspect of the, of the, of the Karanathai's sole. Okay. Make mm -hmm. sense? Yep. All right. So another thing which is very important because some horses need to have shoes, you know, not everything can be barefoot. Right. Um, you know, and as I said, I keep some horses barefoot. I put some metal shoes on some horses and composite shoes. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a plastic shoe Nazi like some people call me. Uh, but <laughs> the most important thing is to really the shoe placement. And here, you see this foot. This foot has a, and has a, nothing to do with the metal shoe. They, people do it with composite shoes and other things too. Um, so this is the articular area, and you. The person that put the shoe on it has, has actually put the shoe to the distortion because the, for some reason, the foot started migrating towards, towards the inside. So it's wider now. It's wider on the, on the medial, medial side than the lateral side. That's a trimming issue. Some horses are naturally this way. This is not the case. And it, it's the same, same shoe, uh, same hoof. Um, that was April. That was March. Oops. That was March of the same year. So your how you trim and how you set the shoe is very important because you will distort distort that capsule when you do that you start changing the conformation of the horse um and as i say those are my shoes so it's not to to um always attack the metal shoes and stuff because some people put shoes correctly in metal and some people shoes incorrectly in composite shoes so here i align myself to the articular area and I st set the shoe to the articular area. Here, that person, that, that's the same horse um, that was during a training course, but it's interesting. And I, that, that happened to a lot of people. Not, and I don't want to attack anyone. It's kind of almost natural because they see the white line, but the white line has shifted with the shear. So they, they go into the shear and they don't place the shoe, oops, place the shoe where it belongs to the articular area. So they go into the flare 
And also what happened, then that's, this is why I don't like people overdoing with cleaning the wall. If they were spending more time taking picture and looking at what the wall looks like and, after, and, and when they look at the articular area, uh, they will see they actually created a fake flare. So it's very easy to kind of remove everything and make your foot look really well, but you're still creating a, a, a shear and a torque and it does affect locomotion. So it's the same thing in proper balance, you know, and it sounds counterintuitive because that hoof tends to have a lot of wall lengths here. So people kept cutting the lateral side, but if have anything to correct that, you had to go and take more in the medial and, and that's counterintuitive, right? That's hard. Yep. So shoe placement, same thing. It, it's the same concept. Um, that's before and it's after, of course, that, 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 that's pretty bad chewing before. But even me, that horse was very sore in the rear. I had a hard time putting the shoe the first time on. So I, I did what I could and it's not placed correctly. And you'll see the travel pattern has changed. And what's interesting with horses, it's not just in loading, it's really when they are in, 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 in the air that they choose to place their shoe, it's proprioceptive. So here, do you see, they, we, oops, where did I go? Uh -huh, mommy. All right, we're back. <laughs> All right, let's go back here. Um, it's subtle, but you can tell also where the shoe was placed right into the flare instead of like putting it more away from the flare, which would be towards the, the inside. And that's, that's, that's the, it's not the same hoof, but it's from the front. It's the same concept. And I, do, I need a lot more uh, 3D props to make sense because I think the shape of the foot is so weird. Another thing, it's not just just um, with putting a shoe, it starts with your trimming. The articular area is here, and then again, you have a big quote flare here, but if you take more here and you lower the heel here, you're actually tipping the foot with time more to the lateral side. So what you need to do, if anything, is it's lower that medial side, and maybe then figure out what you're doing with, with, with quote the flare. In general, I do not clean hoof all the way up, and there's a reason why, because I want to see where, when I'm finished with my trimming, uh, where, where actually my tubules are aligning in relationship to this articular area. So this is the shearing. That shearing's for motion. The, the wall and the sole moves with, with, with itself. And you can tell, you can correct that. You can correct everything, but you can diminish. You can see that little blob here, and the angulation of that blob is different, okay? So... If you, were, if you really want to work correctly with, with feet, try to not remove anything, take picture, and look how your tubules align in relationship to the articular area, all right? Uh, that's another horse, and you can see, not the best, best data, but you will see the same concept. And the shoe was placed a little bit towards the outside into the flare. And look at how the horse is choosing to land. It's different. And if I take in from a lateral view, it's not that bad, but I ride horses and when they twist a little bit more, maybe the first two weeks is not the end of the world because you have you know, removed toe, you have done thing, blah, blah, blah. But after two weeks, I have a harder time because I ride this horse picking up the canter. And, and because the foot start actually twisting and, and, the, and the, the flight pattern is chosen neurologically because they have to accommodate for whatever we, we, the foot is growing out of sync with, with where it should be. And it doesn't mean the horse can naturally stay that way, all right? I hope I make sense. Yes. And, and Lisa, you know, this is- I'm, I am following you. I mean, it's, I, it, you're, uh, you're creating a lot of thoughts, um, but I am definitely tracking with you. Yeah, and you know, it, this is not the most scientific way we took that, that video. We had an argument, my husband and I think, the horse is not right. And they say, it's only a sixteenth of an inch. And like, yeah, but it's not right. And they say, oh, I'm going to take a video. You exaggerate. And sure enough, <laughs> I was right. So um, not to rub it in. But um, yeah, so th this, this is, and I don't know where the other one, where I have after, this is before, say after, and not under the same condition, but you can see. Oh, don't bite me. It's not a very drastic change, but you see more support on the inside. It, it allows the horse to track straighter. And for you uh, canter the part, you know, from walk to other things, it makes a huge difference, a huge difference. So for me, it, 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 
because I ride and I train horses, just for me, I, I don't show, I don't have time, but I, I rehab all those horses so they have to work. Um, so you get the idea. Another little, little thing with uh, the hoof growth, you know, some of the deformities happen naturally. It's just like a nail or something that's going to grow your hair or whatever. So it's natural growth pattern and force acting on the hoof, all right? So um, what, what is important also with horses, and I, I didn't go into detail with that, but there's also quality of tissue. Some horses have naturally very weak bars, which is an extension of the wall, because the bars are acting as, as you know, a little bit of your chassis of your car. And then think also of the serratus muscle, everything kind of work, work together as a, as a spring, you know, it's kind of hanging there. So if you have weak bars, it's an issue. That's why I really like, and I've done that for more than 20 years to support the weight of the horse and give uh, uh, arch support. Some horses don't need it, but I do it preventatively. A lot of horses that have weak bar, it makes a huge difference as, as, as gaining better palmar angle and supporting uh, the navicular bone. It's very important. And you have less displacement um, within the capsule, which is very important. You don't have to cast and do other things. So I kind of like that better. Um, you know, again, look at the difference in the hoof. A lot of people want to have more heel, uh, more, um, um, what do you call that? Uh, um, palmer angle, but you know, but putting a wedge pad on a horse, it's not necessarily good. And a horse that has already adapted from way back when to have a flatter foot and does not have uh, pathologies. And this, this horse, this one particularly, I, I have, uh, I think, uh, x-ray since 1997. Uh, so I can tell you, we do not have huge pathologies and he died when he was 28, 29. So he, he lived with that and he was okay, you know. Um, again, this is not to attack the metal shoe. This is not the farrier's fault. The farrier kind of went and supported the limb where, where the white line is. And I've seen that also with, with composite shoes. I mean, you, yeah, you take your Dremel tool and make, make a quote to remove this flare, but, but, but the foot is completely in, you know, reversed. The, the, the left foot looked like a right foot and the right foot looked like a left foot. And the x-ray didn't look so bad. So again, shoe positioning is very important. And that is done, I fixed it, you know, it's always a pregnant uh, thoroughbred mare, which is hard to fix, <laughs> um, you know, uh, by, by actually slowly, slowly bringing back the, 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 the horn to the center, the capsule to the center of the articular area. And you can see it's, uh, it's unfortunate, um, this was kind of not the highest re resolution uh, pictures I took, so you can't quite see it, but you can see the compression of the wall here. And that, as it grows out, you start also have a better foot. So um, there are consequences. You know, everyone think it's due to the metal or this, but there's also a reality in the competition world. I've done Olympic horses. I, I do a lot of competition horses still. Um, and they have to abide by my rules, otherwise they don't come. Um, you know, the, the, the trainers want certain gates. And what I have seen recently, which I don't see always everywhere, but especially with the quote gated horses or dressage horses, they want to have quote a sliding motion. So they start putting bigger shoes. This is me, this is after that the horse left me. And they want a, 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 sliding, a sliding motion in the foot, but the foot is a foot. You cannot change this, this is the foot. Why would you try, and that's not the fire fault, you, 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 you are demanded as a farrier to gate horses for competition. And, and that's why they call gated horses. And I've seen that, that more and more now to have like almost slider-like um, uh, shoes on the hind of, of dressage horses because they want to quote, extend the gate. And, and this is really bad. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I think we're going back here. So it, it, is, it is a very, very sad horse. I, I, I ended up buying the horse was my client's horse. The client was fantastic, but uh, he, the person had to leave. I couldn't take the horse with him, so I put him on, on for sale, and that's where the trainer started doing uh, a little bit something very wrong with the feet, because that's what she was used to feel on the horse, want that sliding in the back. You know, it's a little bit like the toe grip you, you used to have on race horses, thinking it lengthened the stride and created all sorts of problems. So that's, that's before with me, that's before with me after, when the horse came back, 
Um, so the, this was, the, and it, it didn't happen uh, right away. It was just in, in less than uh, seven months, the horse got, got destroyed. And I paid money for a destroyed horse, but it's mine now. <laughs> So, so just to be clear, because I, I got a little confused with the before and after. So you had been working on the horse, and then okay. he went away, yeah. and it's when he so came this, back. Th this is this is this is when he was a puppy, and he was only five years old, and he has shoes. I mean, he had shoes. I I worked on him till January of 20, 2019, and then he then the, the owner had to sell him to go back to Europe and couldn't take the horse with him. So, so this, this is picture on the right is, is after he got. He left this is, you. This is after he left me, all right? right. Not, af and, not after you wor worked on me. No, you no, no, no. I should have done it, but blood. yeah. <laughs> so, and, but, but look at what, what's fascinating to me. This is the foot. You, you, this foot needed support, you need, you need shoes. It's not like, you know, you could have put a sim simple metal shoe. It doesn't have to be always me, my shoe, whatever. Right. But there's no reason from that foot to go to this. That, right. that is demanded for extending the, the sliding moment of the, of the horse so it appears they have longer stride, all right? And that is not even the farthest fault that's demanded for a lot of dressage horses kind of slide. They want more of that sliding motion. And look what happened to the coronary band before. Yeah. Look, at, look at how much definition you have between the dots. They're almost touching. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you, you, you imagine what you can do to this horse. It's, it's awful. But I'll tell you to just clarify, even though that's what they're shooing this horse to achieve, that's not necessarily going to give them the result they want. Well, they, 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 this is where I think you need to kind of talk to those people a little bit more because it mechanically doesn't do, and I have a video of before and after gates you'll see on another horse, same, same issue. Um, and it's, it's hard to talk to, you know, people who have gone to the Olympics. Not everyone is like that, but it, it's, it's difficult. And, um, you know, it's, that was not the case with this horse, but, but you know, I, and that's why you cannot blame the fires and the vet because they have, to, they have to do what they have to do. You know, if the horse is not lame and it, it doesn't look so horrible, you know, from far away, you know, those are standard, pretty much standard uh, hind shoes, you know? Right. And I don't think the fire was a horrible person either. That's why I'm saying it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated hoof care when it comes down to, to competition, you know? Right. And there, there's an ethic, you know, at some point, what, what are you trying to achieve? And you cannot fake gates. The horse is not, I'm, I'm gonna do a vlog. And this is when he came back in September, 2019. And that's what I got. Wow. So, yeah, he's my horse now. Uh, I have three vets on him. I never paid that kind of money for a real horse. It's, it, and my husband made me promise to, stop shoeing and maybe let other people do it um, because I recuperate too much horses and he wasn't cheap. Uh, and I just couldn't let him go, I was so upset. I mean, this is when he was a puppy, when he came first to come out of Germany. That's when I saw him in, in and he had a nice owner. The owner was nice. That's when I first saw him in, in September. I thought he was gonna die. So I got him. And that's what yours truly is letting other people shoe more and I'm moving away from that because I, I, I think that day I pretty much lost lost any any you know <laughs> being polite in front of people. Well, and but, and you know, to, I I think this is to the point of the webinars. Um, it, in in other words, you know, I I mean, I used to work in Kentucky and I got my master's degree in Kentucky, so I was around racehorse people a lot. Um, if you just unshare your screen, I think at this point. Um, and the I have one more, I have one oh, more video. Okay, never mind. But so what, all I want to say is that, you know, we have these belief systems and we, we also become accustomed to a certain look. And yep. the example is I went to Hawaii once to teach a clinic and all the horses had terrible coats except for one. And we asked the owners about their horses and their coats and they said, well, they look fine to me. And then we talked to the one woman whose horse's coat looked good, was shiny. And she says, oh, I line my fields because this is all volcanic. But the rest right. of the people had become so accustomed to the look of a horse without the line in the fields because it was volcanic that that was normal. And, it's, right. and, and what it requires is comparisons so that we can actually see that there's another option. And if well, you- but, Yeah, you, you'll see, it's, it's, it's why training people because 
I think a lot of people won't do the right thing for the horse. You know, yes. I, I think I think what's changing now. I think you know you have a lot of animal welfare concern, um, but there's a lot of noise, and and I think you know we we have to educate people, and it's mostly the owner we have to educate. But but that, that will make the point. This is a, another. This is a I one uh, dressage horse, and um, so it's it's a Lusitano. It's a stallion, and. It just came out of the, the clinic and they never thought the footing, the shoes were bad. They thought that was just a stifle. And uh, the stifle got injected, which probably needed it. You know, it, there was a little craftiness in the stifle, but nothing serious. Um, so, and look how the horse is moving. And that's the standard, what they, and you, you know, so they thought that was just a stifle issue. And then no one even looked at the foot. Right. Um, and another vet was friend with the owner kind of sent the horse here. And then we're trying to fix it. And that's the second showing. And but you see, to the eye, it's not quite the same speed, but to the eye of a person, they will think actually the horse is tracking not as long, which is not true. And um, so, you know, he's not dragging his toe anymore. Right. <clears throat> and and the lift is the same. You're gonna have more of a lift versus a vertical floating. And again, the the speed is not quite exactly the same, but you get the concept. Yep. And look, look what, what happened to the fetlock. There's too much of a drop. So when you have that kind of stuff and, and you also have shear in it, you're really going to hurt the foot and, and hurt the, the whole body. But this is, the foot is under the bony column. It's, it's just, of course, it's not quite standing right. But this, this is not good. You know, it's still not good. I mean, I'm not saying what I have right now is fantastic. It, it, it's going to take six months to really correct all this, you know. That's why we make a point to not take people that want quick, quick, uh, quick uh, results. Well, there isn't one. It, there isn't one because they need to go through physical therapy or the horse needs to do that. They need to look at their saddle. But, you know, all that is really important. But it's a visual in the, in the mind that actually the horse is tracking longer and it's not. Right, you know, and and that's the thing. It needs to be uh, um, changed. So I, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> so here we are. So I hope I haven't confused. And this was my first horse that started this whole thing. Okay. Well, so we, he, I thank him very much. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm going to stop sharing right now, and then we can. Okay. Here we are. That this so, has been. I, I can't tell you how fascinating this has been, and how uh, educational. I, I really thank you for doing this webinar. I, I, there's, a, I mean, it's, it's, I feel like it's a zip file and I feel like I'll probably need to go back and watch this in small pieces many times to kind of extract some of the information. But you know, what, what, what I really appreciate is that you have found a way to measure things to make them uh, the objective. That right. is, not, and so much of what we do with horses is subjective. You know, it's right. one person's opinion over another, and one person sees it one way, and somebody else sees. And I run into this with training riders all the time: is that it's so subjective. And you know, in the end, I always say, you know, that the horse gets to vote, um, but we have to give him a voice. We have to let him right. have a chance, and he has to have a chance to process and recover when we're making changes. Yeah, and you know, look, I, I'm sure you, you know, I get body work because I, I blew my long psoas. So I have a personal experience of myofascial train, trust me, because hey, that was very painful and took a while. But you can't correct stuff that got broke or has problem in, in a month or two because as you change the shape of the foot, the foot widen, the arch of the sole change, there's all percept, uh, prep, uh, proprioception that change. So, and also, that foot that has been so sheared, you know, like the, the horse are, are, are recovered, are recuperated. He has kissing spine now. He never had it before. He has a little bit of arthritis, which he had in his neck. That, that's not congenital. It started because they start those horses, and he's 19 hand. They start, start horses. Yeah, I know. And don't ask me. I, at that <laughs> okay. stage, okay. I won't. Wait, don't ask me. It's, yeah, it's crazy. I'm 5'5, five five, so, you know, yeah. I, I like to live dangerously. Uh, it, but, you know, you can see the hawk is the hand, end product of a whole series of missteps. And, that, and to undo and untrace that misstep, it's like peeling an onion. So you can't expect 
a horse that has problem like this, I mean, this horse has a real problem. We don't know how far we can fix it, but um, you know, it, it, it takes a while because proprioception change and then the muscle are gonna move and you have tissue displacement, you have tissue under stress, you have the fascia that cannot give till it gives, you know, right. um, and, and people do not understand. And I think it would be very interesting to work also maybe with you and other people, like people start relating to their own body you know, because they don't. And I think unless, that's why I like to do comparative anatomy, comparative biology, comparative biomechanics, because you you can bring in what, what, what it plays into your own life, you know? And I think horse people just, I, you know, it's a little strange. You have a horse, what do you do? There's a leg here, the front here, the mouth, what? You know, and you have a trainer telling you to do this, push here, more legs, uh, but, you know, you kind of don't know what to do. And I think also, unlike maybe you and I, I started riding horses very young. There were still a lot of horsemen, the more horses. Now, people, when they start horses, it's later. You know, it's like in their 30s, yeah. you know, where they're not doing it as kids. And, you know, I had the horses at the farm. I did all the stupid thing, climbing on, on broke horses in the pasture, see how far I could go on them and get tossed, you know. So all this stuff, I don't think... I mean, you know, you would be sued as a farmer if a kid would climb your own horse and get hurt, right? So there, there's a lot of things you, you don't get to do and people have horses much later and I don't think they relate to that. And it's also a society. Well, you know, we also don't use our horses. I mean, they were, they used to be animals that worked. And I think when you look at a working, right. horse, it's a very different thing than a pleasure where, where, you know, they're sitting there eating chocolate in their field for 23 hours a day, or they're standing in a stall, and then we expect them to perform. And so they're deconditioning most of their life. Right, right. right? And then we want them to do high level performance for an right. hour a day or at a, ho a horse show, but we don't consider, you know, we'd never do that with a human athlete. You would never right. decondition right. a human athlete for 23 hours a day, you know? Well, and also what uh, breeding, uh, you know, there, there's enough, stuff out out there were, were breeding horses now that have actually born with neurological damage in their neck because we're overgating those horses so the the laminar section of of the nuclear ligament is actually quite weak i mean in some area that should you know take a donkey or something that that's why they can't budge or or the the the, the first horses you know they had been a little bit thick neck because they evolved this way to fight prey you cannot bring them down but they right. can lock their neck and now we have bred those gazelle that actually have this huge neck and, and freedom of shoulder that is abnormal. So we have pushed those horses to the limit biomechanically and they cannot say stand, you know? And right. it's the same and thing. also not just lacks or ligaments. Yeah. So, you know, they're yeah. very loosey-goosey and so yeah. they can't even really get them fit and conditioned properly because they're, you know, when I get a rider that has loose ligaments, they're, it's so much more difficult for them because they don't have right. the ability of the innate, innately Right, right, and then they have so to. You, the, the the horse I rescued, uh, Bakari, and it was offered to me two years ago for with less money, and I said, no, nah, I don't want to be a horse like that. Nya, 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 nya. He's too young, and I don't want to bleh. I should have taken him before they really broke him. Um, the 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 thing is, he is this loosey goosey horse. When you take an X-ray on him, because he has such long legs, I have to take three or four X-ray of of the pedal one because depending, even if he's totally squared. All he has to do is shift a bit his shoulders, serratus, he goes in a negative plane, and then you do it two seconds later, stand a little different, he's positive. Yeah. You know, because there's so much, so much give in 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 the the, the deep jiva flexor tendon, for instance. So he, he's prone to have back problem, he's prone from birth to have issue. And those horses, if you have them, you got to start them much later. You have to, you have to spend time to tighten up all this stuff. It might be to he's only eight years old. I it's going to be interesting to see how far we can fix it because unfortunately right now he was left with this pavin. Um, he had it already in March. When I got him to my place was uh, October. So he had a huge pavin that was never treated. So he, as a result right now, and we threw everything at him. I mean, trust me, he had chocolate therapy, everything, everything, everything. He was an excellent vet. Um, and we, we, you know, he, he, he shows signs of probably a, a fusing his hawk and we hope it's only the lower part of the hawk not not the where, where it matters the most and we'll see you know but yeah it's it's but it is a testament of what we're breeding these days and right. how, how soon 
And I think it's really hard for, for that's why people will buy horses that should stay away for those extreme horses. Yeah. And I know that they win because they get that long gait, but they do that with the jumper too. I talked to some jumper people and they're the same problem. Those horses that can't make it to the highest competition cannot even go back to be an average pleasure horse for a person that competes at the lower level because they, they, their body are so broken down already. So yeah. we have to start questioning what we're breeding. It's not just a showing. Anyway, right. no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, absolutely. And, you know, we, we tend to always go for extremes and, and push, I mean, just look at dogs, and push the limits of things right. instead of recognizing, and like some of the breeds that are closed book that we're trying to turn into sport horses when they were right. never designed, you know, we have right. to really have some ethics about what we're breeding and what yeah. the breed is and right. maintain a certain standard that's not going to have the big modern movement. Um, well, yeah, and, and you see, when you give that freedom of shoulder, you are gating horses, yeah. but those horses were not meant. They're doing it now with, with breed were very ancient, like beautiful Lusitanos and Andalusian, and they're destroying this breed. I mean, not everywhere people are, but you know, yeah. So anyway, but I, I think people are aware of it, you know, so I hope it's, it's going to go back to normal and, you know. I hope. Yeah. We'll see, so. I will. Otherwise, we have a, 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 a cigarette and margarita. And <laughs> <laughs> we'll become bitter. <laughs> there. Well, this has been truly fascinating. And, I, and you, you've been so generous of your knowledge and information. And I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it's people like you that are out there doing real science and real research that are going to push the world forward. Because right. when, when you have real data, and that's, you know, one of the things I really struggle with Surefoot is that I have no data. Um, right. I have only eight years of experience with horses all around the world, watching changes and watching horses, you know, it, improve the proprioception. And while we all acknowledge that it's powerful and meaningful to the horses, I'm still hoping um, that there's a couple of universities that are talking about doing some, some research, but that's really, it would right. be just wonderful to have someone. Um, and, and what's happened with the pandemic, of course, is now the two possibilities that I know of where they had approvals. I don't even know what's happening with that at this point, but um, you know, I mean, but, and in spite of that, you know, I mean, I don't have the scientific hard numbers to back it up, but I certainly have the, the um, field data from the horses. But I think it's important, you know, I, I, I do believe in hard science, but I think, you know, there are things that common sense, you know, and, and, and it, it should be also re be rewarded, you know, I mean, because I think if you don't always have all the numbers, it's a it, common sense exists also. I mean, frankly, really what happened, you know, I mean, that, that, you know, so I don't feel bad if you don't have all the data. I'm sure you're, you're doing great stuff because I think the sure fruit is fantastic. So it's great. So I'm pretty happy. So good. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you for you your, 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 your time. <laughs> this has been okay. marvelous. And I, I, if you don't mind, I might call on you again sometime to, to come back and, and do another talk. Yes, I, I would love to. I, as I say, I want to do more, you know, a little bit locomotion because it's more interesting to me. The foot, you know, I've done the foot and foot, the foot, the foot. But what's on the top is really, really what also destroys the foot, you know? So yeah, absolutely. Anyway. And I promise my husband I will not rescue another horse. <laughs> I said it in public. All okay, right? we've got you on tape. <laughs> it's in for, for posterity because it'll be up on my YouTube channel. Yes. So, thank you again so much. And so for all of you watching, if you had to end early, you can go to my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel and find all of my webinars there. Also, you can find more information about Surefoot at our new website, surefootequine.com. You can join our Facebook page, Surefoot Equine, and the fans of Surefoot is a great place to ask questions about how Surefoot can help your horse. Thank you all so much for joining me. And once again, Monique, thank you. It was a pleasure to meet thank you, you, even if it's on Zoom. And uh, I look forward to uh, maybe meeting you in public sometime and having you yeah. back. Yes. Well, you should have come to the Epona Mind event, but we don't have an event and I don't I know, know everything's but yeah um, you know the the one good thing about all of this is that I've um I travel so much and teach riding that um during the pandemic I've been home and I've been able to catch up with people that I've wanted to for years right. but just haven't had the time so I you know I am grateful for this time that we've been, you know been able to have together with all the you and all my other guests it's been really amazing okay thank you thank you and uh, have a good night bye, -bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.